All right, good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening. Thanks for coming to our February meeting. We've got a big agenda tonight with a few recognitions, starting with our mics in that. Moira Rocket. Joey Hood and Coach Beth Lutz. And I'll just say the reason that this particular team is here, we had four teams that qualified for the state, and this team actually won the Rising Star State Awards, who the best in the state is Rising Star. So uh, the district's done the, the, the Lego League for a couple of years now, and um, it runs through, there's the Junior First Lego League, which is for the little ones, and it's really just kind of fun playing with Legos. And then you start to get into robotics this year. Uh, we have fourth and fifth graders on our team. Um, and it, it goes up, and it's really a stepping block towards a career in engineering. So uh, we're feeling really fortunate. I'm a parent, obviously. So I feel really fortunate to have this program available to us. Um, I think the kids really enjoyed it, and I'll bring the kids up now. Um, this is our team, the Rocket Penguins. Uh, we'll start with Sophie over here. She was our uh, official captain this year because she is a fifth grader and she's moving on to middle school, so she'll be in a different league next year. Uh, Emma Hood, um, uh, Cole Noah, and then Robbie Lutz. Um, so quickly, what we have here, Robbie's holding our robot. Um, what's the robot's name? Moby. Yep. So that's Moby. Um, and then Cole, if you wouldn't mind opening up the poster there real quick for us. One of the challenges that the kids are faced with is there's a theme, and that with that theme they have to come up with a solution um, to a problem, and the theme this year was into orbit. Um, so it's a space theme, and what the kids picked was boredom, which initially I think we took as kind of a knock against how we were coaching. Um, <laughs> but um, they, they quickly uh, kind of got into it and really understood all the aspects of it, um, from uh, dopamine to habituation, uh, deprivation, variety, choice, the whole thing. And the whole theme was our astronaut Moby loves this thing called a snicker pickle. Picture it in your mind, the snicker and a pickle. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> and in order to kind of, he got bored with the snicker pickle and wanted to find something that was maybe a little bit more fun. So what did he come up with? The bacon wrap snicker pickle. <laughs> Total game changer. So um, if you have any questions for the kids, uh, they're, they're ready to answer. And we also have a quick video for you as well. Um, so it started out in the morning with uh, some different judging sessions. Uh, the kids, the team went in and presented really the solution that they came up with in one. Um, there was another judging session where they really had to show their teamwork. I've actually, I'm, s I'm still not totally clear on the details and what happened in the room when they had to show their teamwork, but they, they went through some team activities to show the core values. Um, I'm going to see if I can recite all the core values. Maybe you guys can help me. I know the first one is discovery, innovation, impact, fun, fun, we're real good at fun, and teamwork, and inclusion, and inclusion, and, and the, we were very good at that one too. Um, so they showed their strengths and the core values, and then a third judging session was talking through how we had programmed our robot. In the afternoon, we went to the big, the game floor, and they had You'll see the, the game board where we had our programmed robots running. Um, we got one official practice round of two minutes and 30 seconds, and then it was like the basketball buzzer went off. <laughs> Your time's up um, to practice. And then we had three more rounds to accomplish as many tasks as we could with Moby, um, specific space-related tasks on this big board. Um, and uh, so it was a pretty high-pressure situation. It required really good time management. Um, good teamwork and planning and just a lot of precision and 
the ability to both slow down and be really careful and precise, but also move quickly, which is an important skill for a fourth or fifth grader to learn. Um, so and that was that was the whole day, and then uh, then yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> I should note that the video, the song that's going to play, Cole actually helped me answer this. If you ever need like music for any kind of video, here's your guy right there. Cole's phenomenal. <laughs> Discovery, go and throttle up. now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Roger, zero T, and I feel fine. should tell you that we had um, there are competitions all around the state and only the top 48 make it to the state competition and so then to be one of the award winners at the state is quite an accomplishment there are 32,000 first leg of league teams internationally uh, we have 36 here in uh, Fort Thomas junior first leg of league and first leg of league so as you can see it's a ton of fun uh, Schultz there helps coach uh, a team um, and uh, it's just exciting to see. So we hope that these students can go all the way up to 12th grade because we're one of the few districts in the state and in the region that has first Lego League and first robotics competition all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. I understand you got a Lego made first place trophy over there. Did you make that? No. <laughs> Well, uh, awesome job. Uh, so in recognition, we have some cool certificates for you. So you have to come up and get one of those. And then also each one of you get a, whoop, there it is. Yeah, state champion t-shirt on the back that says, winning isn't everything, it's just how we do it. So come on up here. One of you come up here, grab the t-shirts, grab the certificates. Come on up. Awesome job. Thanks, though. Awesome. Thank you. Great job. What's that? Oh, I guess that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nice job.
Thank you. And then uh, we're going to move on now to uh, Portrait of a Graduate Global Leader Awards. And Karen, take it away. Yes. So this, our focus for this, uh, the board meeting today is about our Portrait of Graduate uh, Committee. So we've had several people who've been working uh, for about the last year in developing instructional blueprints for each of our competencies uh, so that we can make, move forward in actualizing our portrait of a graduate. Um, so you can see this is the list of all the people on the committees, all of the um, community members, our teachers, our administrators who have been meeting quite a bit to develop these blueprints. Later on in the agenda, you'll get to see videos that which describe each of these and then see the work that each of these committees has done. But we just wanted to recognize right now our chairpersons for these committees. Um, and then we will also be giving certificates to all of our members uh, of these committees before. These people definitely um, are demonstrating our competences that we want of, from our portrait of a graduate. Um, for all of our students. And so first of all, our chairpersons for the Courageous Leader Competency Committee are Patrick Richardson and Kara Yates. So come on up. And we'll hear more, hear more later about what Courageous Leader means. <laughs> Maybe if you all stand up here, we'll get all of you together. How's that? Let's see if you want to stay here. Thanks. Uh, next for our Fort Thomas Independent Schools Global Leader Award, we have Creative Problem Solver, and that's Jason Gay as the chair of that committee. Next, we have Curious Critical Thinker, and that is Keith Faust. And then Empathetic Collaborator, and that is uh, Highlands High School teacher, Angie Gentonio. Um, in case you don't know, Keith Faust is the principal of Woodfill Elementary School. Jason Gay is media specialist at Highlands High School. Kara Yates is fifth grade teacher at Moyer. And Patrick Richardson is our district psychologist. Um, and then global communicator, a teacher at Woodfill, Samantha Reynolds. So thank you very much to all of our chairpersons. Um, and, and of course, there are many, many people who worked very hard on these committees, and we'll be recognizing them a little later. So thank you. Okay, I don't think uh, I saw anybody actually sign in for community forum, but does anybody have anything they'd like to address to the board? If not, we will move along. Okay, well, let's jump into action items then. And, uh, oh. oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know, call me out. Go ahead, say it. Go ahead. I would feel here tonight for our student showcase. I'm just flying on. Kind of our story and some of the things that we've got going on. So uh, I've got a couple of folks of our school, and we're here today to talk to you about our student-led conferences. Uh, you know, one of the things, you know, we've been down our Leader in Me journey for a couple years now, and one of the biggest things that we are focusing on this year is truly living our mission. And our mission at our school this year is to, for our staff and our students, to communicate their thoughts and ideas so clearly, um, 
that the traits of expected leadership are profound. And so one of the ways that we knew that we could do that is by having our students communicate their thoughts and content and ideas. And so I want to have them share out with you a little bit about our student-led conferences. I've also invited uh, one of our parents to share out her perspective on that, as well as Ms. Reynolds, one of our teachers. So um, I'll turn it over to the most important folks of this panel. One way was I would look through my my binder and see what things I wanted to talk about. Then I would then I would get with a partner and act like they're the student or the parent to practice how we would actually do in the real student led conference. I am I am Gabe McDermott. Uh, I am here to talk about the what my WIG goals were and how I followed them. I, my WIG goal was for the second quarter was to become a better basketball player. I did this by practicing for 15 minutes and passing for, for 10 of those. And another, and another, and I completed that WIG goal. And another thing I explained in my, in my student-led conference is that the reason <coughs> attendance is, should be tracked is because the first step of becoming a great student is to be there and be on time. So these are a couple of examples from students uh, that I had to present. You know, our entire student body shared out at their student-led conference with their parents. And so we, it was not lost on us that you know this was definitely a, a shift, right? And um, so we really kind of took a leap of faith and uh, did this asked our students to participate in the student like conferences, knowing that there'd be some pros and cons, but we really felt like this was the best real world example of our students being able to live out our mission. So that being said, I asked one of our parents to give perspective on, all right, what did they think about student like conferences? So this is Dr. Knox. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is interesting because I, I did explain to Keith that by initial reaction to learning that the students were going to be leading their own conferences was, um, I guess, less than enchanted. <laughs> because as everyone knows, as a parent, it's difficult to take that time out of your schedule to make an appointment and get to school, and then you're hoping for some one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher because you're assuming that's how you're really going to learn about your child's progress. But um, I would say at the end of the day, we were pleasantly surprised we met actually with our first grader and our fourth grader in their student-led conferences and um, it was surprising to see how much they were able to tell us about their own progress um, just by using their accountability binders and um, learning all of this information that they're tracking on their own um, so I would say it was a successful experience. You know, I definitely think if you've got a child who has an issue, they're gonna have to carve out some special time with a teacher for that. But I think that's probably true in any situation because conferences, you know, are brief to begin with. So if you've really got an issue, you've got to talk about your scheduling a separate meeting anyway. Um, so it was, it was a little surprising, um, but in a good way. And um, the other thing about the process, and I think about the Leader in Me program in general, um, for me is that I tend to be very hands-on with my children, <laughs> helping them prepare for the next day, doing their schoolwork, things like that. And then 
at the end of the day, sometime I realize I haven't left really anywhere for them to be responsible for things. And so seeing all of this that they track on their own on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel like that level of personal responsibility, that you know, accountability that they're learning through this is something, it's not just you know, a core skill, but I think like a survival skill that they're gonna need going forward and that they're getting from this program. So um, overall, I have a pretty um, positive outlook, I think, on it. Interesting, I hadn't talked to her prior, but our, some of our concerns were the same. I thought prior to these conferences that the parents would all still want one-on-one -on -one conferences and that the kids would only focus on their positives, that they wouldn't share concerns or area growth with their parents. Neither one of those things happened. The parents actually, what I found during the conferences, got more information from the students than they would have from, from me. They were very much and growth driven where when I had parent conferences I might just say well he has a B in writing but I really think he has potential to get an A so let's work on that and that would be kind of where I stopped but the kids would go to their binder and they'd say well in October on my writing piece I scored an 11 and they'd show the rubric and then in September I scored a 13 because I moved idea development from a 1 to a 2 they were much more specific than I would have been. And then the parent questions, they would say, well, so now what can we do next? What are we gonna work on next month? So that post-conferences, that accountability piece is already set for me as a teacher where the parents now can say, remember you said you were working on transitions, are you doing that? And so that, I know those conversations are taking place at home because they got that information from the conference from their students, not from me. So I felt like, they got so much more, not only just feel good because all of the parents want to come and hear good things, but they also got tangible things that they can work on and, and improve as they go forward. So, so in conclusion, you know, my takeaway of our student-led conference, um, you know, I think we need to take the perspective of our parents, take the perspective of our students, and we need to continue to sit back and evaluate and say, how we, can we continue to make this process better, right? So I think as it stands right now, I would definitely mark this down as a win. I think our students had an opportunity to live our mission, but I think we need to listen to our parent feedback and say, what are some ways that we can still provide those opportunities for our parents' voices to be heard? And so I think that's our challenge moving forward towards next year. You know, I had a unique opportunity to sit in that role as a parent as well. Uh, which was different. Um, and, you know, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of what goes on at school. Just kidding, I have a firm <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. and, you know, to be able to sit down and have that conference as a dad uh, was really a unique situation. And I was able to get and glean so much from that insight as my daughter. As she talked about what her goals were and her growth and what was it she was working on and what it was that she was proud of. Because what I thought she was proud of, conversely, what she was proud of were two totally different things. And so it was really great for me to have that opportunity to talk to her, to listen to her, to share those experiences. So I think if, um, you know, everyone in our school got a fraction of what these guys had, uh, you know, I know that it was a very worthwhile experience. So for us, student-led conferences were a really benefit. Great. Thank you. you. <laughs> While they're getting their picture taken, does the board have any questions for the kids before they have a seat? It's hey kids, real quick, do you have any questions? I don't have a question, but um, because I'm, high school is my area, those skills, when a lot of times seniors weren't able to critique themselves and figure out. So learning that, it'll become part of their fiber. And so I love that. Yeah, yeah I'm really glad. And we discussed that, that really mm -hmm. especially for like the younger kindergarten and first grade, that we would just be planting those seeds to help them develop those skills. But one of our big takeaways is they're already capable. They have those skills. We're not planning for the future. We're just focusing on what they can do now. Yeah. So I applaud that. So good job. You did an awesome job presenting in front of the crowd. And you're also on TV. So for coming tonight and presenting to us, uh, we have t shirts for you. Big H on the front. Reaching tradition focused on the future on the back. So come on up here, and I'll let Mr. Faust help you organize those. I've got three of them here, so 
once you take all of those and you all figure that out. All right, nice job. And I just wanted to say that, you know, we are trying to, in each of these forums, that um, as the schools present, they're focusing on one or more of the portrait of graduate competencies, so you couldn't have a better representation of courageous leadership um, as our students definitely demonstrated. Thank you, Woodsville, for presenting this month. All right, we'll move along now. I don't think there was anybody for the community forum, and so if not, now we'll move on to Gary for uh, the Action Items Johnson Elementary Replacement Project. This should be hopefully relatively quick, just a few uh, updates and then the uh, couple action items. Obviously, we haven't started work at 1180 North Fort Thomas yet. We're still actively having school down there. But uh, the staff at Morrell has been actively working with their subcontractors and the architect to get all their submittals in and, and get, be ready to move when they mobilize into the site, which their contract's going to say they get the site May 1st. So um, they have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, um, mostly with subs and the architects. So um, they feel very comfortable and ready to roll as soon as they're able to get on site. So the couple of action items is last month you uh, approved the specifications for both demolition and uh, hazardous materials abatement. Those bid, uh, we got numerous bids uh, for each one. We got very good pricing on them. We're going to start with, I believe, the demolition. We received six bids. Um, if you recall the way it was structured, there was an alternate that allowed um, the contractors to allow for a deduct. Um, we received alternates from two companies, um, quite varying different amounts. Um, but based upon the base bid, which we had very good pricing on the base bids and the gracious deduct from Jose Project Movers, coming up with a total price of $175,000. Uh, Robert Emmett Hayes and Associates are recommending that you um, approve or you accept all bids and award a contract to Jose Project Movers, Jose Project Movers for $175,000. I didn't see in those that the, um, the original demolition bidder did not bid. Uh, correct. The, the, the company that most of the contractors, uh, general contractors had put into their bids did not bid this individually. So. Okay. Any questions? Don't know. What your original bid was was not, it was still almost $90,000 different from what the original bid was. Yes. For their lowest bid. The, the bid that their, their low, the lowest bid that they put on any one general contractor package was two hundred twenty thousand dollars, but the one on Morell's was closer to the the two eighty number that we we ended up getting the bids. So, okay. That's what their contract dates are, yes. Because they don't, because they don't have to be That, the, technically, the, uh, in an addendum, they were, all contractors were told, don't worry about a completion date, here's your completion date. Yet most of them provided a completion date anyway. So. They actually did not have to provide a completion date because they were told in the addendum that your completion date is the end of April. Good? Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. The next one is what? Award of hazardous materials and vapor materials. We also received 
a number of bids. Uh, the bid tabulation is actually included in the recommended award letter from uh, Air Source Technology, our consultants on that. We received three bids. Um, all three were below the projected budget. Um, the low price of 61750 uh, was turned in by Environmental Demolition Group. That's the same group that did the second half of abatement at Moyer Elementary, so we have worked with them before. Okay. Um, you know, they uh, were about 30% below the uh, projected budget of $90,000. So that leaves, which those, those consultants at AirSource usually project high because of the potential for running into unknown conditions. So it's not uncommon for bids to come in 25% lower than their proje projection. It gives us that wiggle room if, if we need it. So uh, they are recommending that you approve environmental, accept all bids and award a contract to Environmental Demolition Group. Where would they start? They will start as soon as we're out of the buildings. Okay. So we have given them um, uh, the latest April 8th but it'll go in phases as they do a building. You know, it won't be right. they move in and then leave and then give it to Jose. As, as they clear a build, as we clear a building, they're getting it, and then as they clear a building, Jose will get it. it. Likely prior to the date that we've told them they could have the buildings taken down. How long, Jerry, does it, you know, for, for Moyer, so how long would you expect this to take a jump? Moyer, because it was a renovation on that portion, required a significant, uh, significantly more abatement than this project, which you only have to abate the material that has to be abated to demolish it. So there's much less that has to be done. And what they have to do is relatively easy, straightforward work. Primarily because through all the different times we've done work in the building, we have previously abated probably 80% of what was in that building, or those buildings, I should say. So there wasn't a ton of work. There's much less work um, for them to do mostly pipe fitting and, and, you know, pull some carpet up to double check the floor tile underneath. Questions? Do they, uh, do they get a list of the things that they're going to need to abate in there? Yes. Or yes. do they do their own? No, Air Source Technology spent a couple days going on probably over a year ago uh, to go into the buildings. And um, they've been working with the district for 15 plus years in terms of managing our abatement uh, program and uh, making sure we're in compliance with all regulations so they know the buildings really well but they spent a uh, couple days on site over winter break not this most recent one but the year before going through the building poking up above ceilings going in the tunnels looking underneath trying to make sure that their bid documents were as accurate as possible so what's in the floor tunnel and as best as insulation around the piping majority are some pipe fittings um, on some corners in some areas that we didn't have to previously abate because they were in some tunnels and, and in some other areas um, that we don't really go into. And then floor tile that's been encapsulated underneath carpet or other layers of tile as well. There's a chance that they'll take up carpet and go, nothing underneath there now. But we could even get some credits on that $61,000 price. Do we have a list of that stuff? Basically, I mean, I guess it's in the air source report, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a copy of that? Sure. Okay. Just email it to me. I'd appreciate it. I can. Great. Thank you. Okay. If no more questions, I need a motion for approval. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next item is uh, Rosanna Johnson, the elementary temporary re relocation project. This is just a quick update, um, we're proceeding on. Um, one thing that we have developed uh, since the last board meeting is in consultation with the Northern Kentucky Independent Health District, or I'm not sure if they're going by that name anymore, um, but they have uh, put a full court press on us that we really like to see us hook the restrooms up in the classrooms. So we are proceeding along those lines. We have put together, um, we've worked with Cardinal Engineering, Robert Evan Hayes and stuff to uh, see what it would um, what it would take to make that happen and push that through in an expedited manner to get the various approvals. 
um, those plans are all complete and all on their way, if not already down at the state to make that happen. Um, and right now the game plan is to, um, we may still have a restroom building that's hooked up to sanitation and water in that area to provide out in the mobile village a, a, a bank of restrooms, um, but to have the restrooms in the classrooms where we have them hooked up. So we're proceeding along that path. So it hasn't cost them any extra time. Our plan was to maybe get down there and, and, and uh, get started on the footers this week, but um, Mother Nature's not been very kind in that regard. No. So we're still looking at as soon as it's dry getting started. So. so each of the units will have a bathroom facility in it already? Not all of them will have it. Um, we know for sure that eight of the 11 double classroom ones will it will um, we are hoping to get a couple more two classroom units with restrooms at least one restroom in it and the unit that we had uh, contracted for for the office does not have a restroom area in it so right next to but they would be right next to it yes where is the tap in we are what well, we're what Cardinal Engineering's recommendation is, is in the back, what you would, what I would refer to as the back corner of the parking lot over by the retention pond to go ahead, uh, run throughout the practice field, hook up there, run along the parking lot, kind of past the maintenance areas behind the building and hook into a manhole that's running back behind the football field. One of the, one of the original reasons we didn't look at that avenue is because they were requiring us to go to the closest manhole, which is actually under the field house. So when we made the decision that we could go, basically go a longer run, that we could make it happen and for, and not for a cost that would make it, you know, cost prohibitive. So. I figure something out about that. Uh, so that we part of a, a separate project will bid out? We, we got the emergency declaration from the state on the BG1, so we're allowed to go ahead and send bid specifications to, uh, you know, contractors we know, um, get a minimum of three prices, which Joe has already kind of put together that list of people to send to, um, but we do not have to do a formal bid process. We just have to follow up with additional documentation to the Department of Education. Basically the emergency situation because of timing. Yes. So hopefully um, when we get back together again in March, you will see buildings down there and we will be uh, moving in, or at least not the Johnson staff, but our staff will be inside them doing work. work. And just to kind of update everyone as well on transportation, so Matthew Winkler and Ashley Nicaeus and Jerry and Jamie and Bill and others are meeting tomorrow to kind of tie up the uh, transportation. So Ashley has sent out a survey to all of the families, and I think maybe you're, you're going to be doing that some more too, just to make sure everyone has signed it up. So we know exactly how many want to use the bus. And I think at last count, Matthews couldn't be here tonight, but I think there were 60 some. 71, it is a bus for 80, so even on one route, is, but it could be two. Uh, but just kind of working that out to, to determine exactly how the transportation will work, how many students will ride the bus, how does, how does, how does the whole thing work? So they are meeting uh, on that. And then we'll have updates with the city as well. This is the first time we really transported that many students for a regular school day. I know that we're talking with the logistical six of carpool as well as the bus. Mm -hmm. I can share that Matthews can spot it where every Johnson home is. Uh, every school in the Grove to Johnson who needs the Google Maps can can spot everybody. And so he has routed it to where um, the the bus route. And whoever wherever the big biggest that's going to be a stop. So, for example, he would want to stop at 
we had already been asked about doing that on the way home because you know it's it's easier maybe for parents to get them in the morning you know the bus would stay there but in the afternoon most parents aren't off work at 2:45, 3 o'clock by the time the bus would come so they thought this way instead of students having to walk home from sort of a, maybe a, a location that's farther away from their home that they would be able to he would be able to uh, let off students, you know, at different points along the way, so that they're closer to their homes. So that just makes sense to try and have that for all students on the way home, to, on the way there too. Any other questions? Any questions about either of the projects? Um, I just want to say thank you for to keep working on the bathrooms and the classroom. Sometimes the easiest things. Um, Sometimes those are harder to do, the logistics. And, you know, I'm a time on task learning girl. So, you know, the more time, I, it, it worried me about the kids having to leave. I think, I think the Ashley and them had a good plan in place that we could make it happen. Uh -huh. um, but we're glad that, that we're able to go that direction. Yeah, and thank you for working on that. Thank you. All right, next item is to establish a position for occupational therapists, Summer. for an occupational therapist. Um, historically, this is a position that we have contracted either with individuals or with agencies to provide these services to students um, over the last several years. The caseload of the um, occupational therapist has grown and um, she is now working full 40 hours a week, five days a week um, in order to meet the needs of our students. So um, we felt that by hiring an occupational therapist as a staff member, as an employee, that um, we could better utilize the skill set of that individual as well as provide a cost saving for the district. Um, so just some of the perks of that would be that she could put, um, attend RTI meetings to provide some strategies to the teachers um, to better meet the needs of students before they actually reach the level of um, entering special education. Uh, she could serve as a mentor to practicum students, so bringing on um, other uh, individuals who are studying to become occupational therapists and um, provide them with that experience within the school setting. Uh, she could provide trainings to the teachers and assist with developing individual student plans, um, collaborate with staff during meetings, um, keep track of district-wide inventory to ensure that we're appropriately utilizing our resources and keeping track of them. So just some of the things that, you know, we felt would be beneficial to the district and to the students as a whole. Any questions? So we would be hiring the same individual that we have been outsourcing with? So I think there's a little bit more background. Um, okay. Um, we also were ad sort of advised uh, from our auditor and from Andy that we really did need to make this change as well because of the amount of hours that she works. So she's really seeming to be out of the realm of what constitutes an independent consultant and more in the realm of what an employee does. So we've been advised that we can just transfer her over to that uh, role um, as a, an employee and then we would actually have to go back and, and put her on payroll. Uh, from the beginning of the year because she has been acting as an employee instead of an independent consultant according to those, those guidelines. So she's currently, um, she has a paycheck waiting for the month of January. So what, we, what Andy and I talked about maybe doing is um, putting that back through payroll and just starting her from January 1st moving forward as an employee. So she only does work for us anyway. She does. Okay. Yes. And she's an independent contractor, not through an agency then? Correct. Mm -hmm. And would her days be similar to a So she would, um, the proposal is for 188 days, and so it would be five days a week and um, seven hours a day. And then uh, she would be considered a classified employee paid on the certified salary schedule. Mm -hmm. So similar to what we did with the speech pathologist. Any other questions? So we paid her monthly as a 1099 independent Correct. contractor. Mm -hmm. She has not been paid yet for January. Correct. Paycheck's kind of hanging.
hanging out there right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you have no more questions, then we need a motion to approve this uh, position for occupational therapist. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next is the RFP for school activity and cafeteria deposit. As you may have heard, we have a banking institution that will be losing a branch in the center of town, and that is our primary banking institution. Due to the frequency of the visits from the school and the cafeteria, we are asking to release a new RFP to then pursue a local branch of a different institution to carry on those five different accounts. So um, it would be that we are going to extend this through March 1st, and then it would be approved at the next board meeting. Okay. Just to sort of explain this a little more. Um, so you probably know we, you all just did an RFP not too long ago, and it was BB&T, and they were far and away the best bid. Uh, we had only one other company that had bid. Uh, we can't just go with that second company, which does have an office right in town. Uh, we do have to put it out for an RFP. We've been advised that legally we have to do that. So we would continue to have everything else there, but this way it just gives us the opportunity not to have to go that far with our daily deposits, which could be quite substantial from the cafeteria and the, and the school. So we did get legal advice that we do have to go through this process for that. So do we have a, some type of contract with bb &T then or no? We do. Um, when we put out a request for proposal, um, I think it's been about seven or eight months ago we do that. Okay. And we have a great deal with them, I'll just have to say. They charge us no fees and they give us great interest. Um, the cool. second company on that list did not do that. Um, so we hope that we get another company, another bank in town that could be generous like bb and was. Yes. So Brad, to answer your question, bb &T is going to release us from the accounts that we're questioning today. We've met with them. It would be the five local school accounts and then the cafeteria account. So, offer, so to speak, being significantly better. Our only reason for leaving is the logistics of it, of right. being able to physically go over there and drop off a check or whatever. It would be red book requirements and then looking at just safe practices financially to make deposits daily. And so after discussing the length of the trip to Highland Heights from each school every single day, we felt that it would be in our best interest to pursue other options and other banking for those accounts. This can't all be handled electronically? No. It's usually cash on hand. Like after game receipts and that sort of thing. <laughs> now, our vast majority, I don't know what the percentage is, at least 90, 95% of our funds will stay at bb &T. Correct. So our, you know. Daily things. Daily, yeah, this is just for the cash deposits. Correct. Well, I'm not thrilled about the fact that we're giving up a much better situation. No, I know. Well, perhaps we'll get. Probably get not. Be positive. Perhaps. If it turns out that the responses to the RFP are not favorable, it, would it be in our best interest to stay where we are, or is that, I mean, that's to be determined. That's, that would be that a discussion. That is an option, and that would be a discussion. Yes. <coughs> I do feel as if we're under a time crunch. You know, if we're considering that that bank is going to have the branch close April 5th, we would have to, you know, order checking and all of that should change. However, if we're going to stay there, we're not going to have to make measures take place prior to them closing. We would come back to discuss and then make arrangements with our students. I mean, there's a security considering that it's cash. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's also time. It's not like you guys have to leave at the end of the day. You know, you still your hours up to get to the bank to deposit the money. So say you have to travel further, then you have to leave work earlier. Or be away from the building in the middle of the day if they go in the middle of the day. So it's time out of the office each day. Well, I would suggest we not sever our tie yet with BB&T until we see what comes out of the bids. And then, 
they, com they understand our situation and we are still in good hands. I feel that our relationship with them is still positive. They understood and we're gonna consider them a key ally and if it doesn't work out with a different RFP um, recipient, then we will consider our next steps at the next meeting. Yep. Can I need a motion to uh, approve this RFP? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. You're still up there, right? Oh, KSBA yeah. policy auto. Actually, it's very brief. So we are considering okay. KSBA <laughs> Chapter 5, and that would be facilities. So I collaborated with Jerry to discuss all of the, the policies that would be in that chapter, and we are up to date. So I don't have anything right now. I have no second readings from Chapter 4 because that's on hold. So it's just a quick update to say next month will be Chapter 6, and we will discuss that further. How many chapters are there? There are 10. Right, boy, boy, boy. You know what? I don't. I think it is, yes. But when we, there are right, so many chapter, things already with chapter, that chapter. I know, so and already, when we get closer yeah. toward the end, that's going to be a very active time in our lives. <laughs> Cannot wait. Yes. <laughs> Cannot wait. All right, thank you. Okay, last action item tonight is staffing guidelines for 1920. Yes. So um, if you, we kind of understand we're in the process right now of student scheduling and us looking at enrollment and our trends and uh, thinking about the number of students for next year. And the state goal, and of course our goal, is to make sure that all of our schools have their allocations by March 1st. That's the law that uh, we give those to the SBDM councils by March 1st. And what determines what their allocations are is dependent on this set of staffing guidelines. Um, and so each school district submits, the, bo the board approves uh, the staffing guidelines, and then those are submitted to the state, and then we must allocate based on that. Um, so we have made no changes to that this year. Uh, you know, last year we added uh, counselors, and so we want to continue to staff our classrooms very generously, and we've talked about before. Uh, we currently allocate our staffing guidelines, cause us to allocate, or we've given additional allocations as well, um, to allocate over like 48 additional teachers over the state and 27 instructional assistants over the state. And so we've continued uh, to keep those guidelines and we'll stay on par with that, those generous allocations so we can make sure there are adults in classrooms. No changes. No changes. Uh, one thing that Ms. Meyer brought up is uh, there is Senate Bill 1 uh, going on in the state right now, which is a safety, guide, safety bill. And uh, with that bill, there is some discussion about mental health counselors. And so we may have to come back later and try to and figure out what we're gonna do about that if, we're, uh, if we need to add additional counselors. But we feel pretty good, as you saw last month, mm -hmm. about where our counselors are now, so. Yeah, that was a great article on uh, Fort Thomas Matters about the counselors as well. The whole series. Good. Does that bill also request an SRO at each school? Um, I think they did amend that. So I don't know if it's a full SRO or just SROs assigned. Um, the other thing that it has is it's requiring a risk assessment survey. Uh, we did actually meet uh, uh, Bam Carney, Representative Carney, and Representative Regina Huff, who are on the Education and Safety um, Committees, did meet with myself and a couple of their superintendents uh, to talk about the resiliency poll that we do. Um, by, it's called now by Terrace Metrics. And uh, they were very interested in the impact of that. It is, now that actual poll it will be used by the entire state of Ohio coming up, and then many districts already in the state of Kentucky. And the Center for School Safety um, addressed it and talked about it and has really played it up. And so we think that that risk assessment survey that is now in that bill is referencing the resiliency poll that we're doing. Uh, now we hope there'll be some funding coming with that, Currently, we don't pay for it. Uh, the Northern Kentucky Education Council gets businesses who were paying for that in Northern Kentucky. Uh, but that may end up being a district, a school a statewide survey. Okay. All right, any other questions? Uh, we need uh, to, uh, we need a motion for approval for the staffing guidelines for 1920. So move. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. All right, that is it for action items. We're gonna move on to discussion items. And Bill, you can stay up there for a while, it looks like.
first is an assessment accountability update for you. Um, so as you know, when we transitioned to the current accountability system of which we're in, uh, it came with a lot of changes that we've been adapting to both the last academic school year and then also this one. There were also several um, pending and forthcoming elements to the accountability system that would manifest in fall 2019 from a reporting standpoint. So um, there are actually right now actionable items happening through legislation that are going to cause changes for us to prepare for moving forward um, that sort of are unaligned or disaligned with what the plans were already. Uh, so let me explain what those are. So first of all, um, I do think you should be well aware of what testing will look like in the school district moving forward, really in the state actually. So in grades three through eight, there are no changes. So no changes here. You can embrace this with uh, the core knowledge that you're already quite aware of. Uh, all of our students in grades three through eight will be taking reading and math tests. That'll happen at each grade level. Science will continue to be assessed in the fourth and uh, seventh grades. Social studies um, will be continued to be assessed in fifth and eighth grades. And then on-demand writing will be in the fifth, eighth, and 11th grades, uh, which of course we're stopping at eight here. So just fifth and eighth grades. So no changes to, to those grade level bands. High school is different. High school is a little bit of a different situation this year. First of all, um, each of their state assessments in the month of May, that'll be when our window is, um, will be online for the first time. Uh, so our students are certainly digital citizens. That's not gonna be a very difficult transition for them, but from an administrative standpoint, that will be a new endeavor for us to kind of take on. Um, this is the year, this is the time that this grade 10 field test is happening for the first time. This is kind of the precursor to what has been uh, set up for the future, which is all students in grade 10 will need to pass a proficiency exam in reading and mathematics. So this is sort of a field test to begin that process. So essentially we will not get results back from grade 10 next, next fall. We will not see this reported how students, well allegedly, you will not see how this is reported, um, how students perform on grade 10. It will just be feedback. Uh, it will be basically information that the state <coughs> will consider for further development of those tests. What will so be we won't have any idea the results of these? Uh, no, sir. We, I, I anticipate that we will not receive any feedback on student performance. Um, however, grade 11, so. you, can, you can be happy with this one. Grade 11, we will get results. This will be um, an on-demand writing test, which our students are used to taking in the 11th grade. In fact, our juniors tend to be quite proficient, uh, quite frankly, in that domain. Uh, it will be online, though, for the first time, so they're used to writing that out. So they will be typing the responses. A little bit different, but again, they're already quite fluent in that. Uh, in that task. What is new though, and we ta I talked about this briefly earlier <laughs> in the year, our grade 11 students will be taking a science operational test for the first time. It's sort of like in how we used to have our end of course biology test. I'm likening it that to that experience, but I am not uh, suggesting that the content is end of course biology. It is not. Uh, it will incorporate uh, the science standards from all leveled courses up through the junior year. So essentially ACT science-like content is what will be covered on this test. I do anticipate that we will receive data, meaning student performance data, um, on, uh, based upon how they perform. However, we won't be accountable for that data for 2019. It will just be reported. It will not be, we will not be accountable for that. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> So that's what we expect. So the, from an assessment standpoint, that's a little bit of an update for testing. Oh, well, th let's, let's go ahead and be comfortable knowing that we aren't gonna be accountable for the grade 11 science scores. I, I feel comfortable indicating that that is a true statement. Um, so I don't hold that with much anxiety. So is it safe to say that the grade 10 field test, uh, the reason they would not be giving us results is they're wanting to evaluate if they're going to be failing half of the state of Kentucky? I would certainly point to that as one component, one rationale. Another could be it's not written yet, so you know the quality <laughs> is potentially a little questionable. Um, so there are probably multiple factors, but the one that you identified is likely a, a strong consideration. So the only guidance that um, they've, they've, they've provided so far to high schools is that it is likening it to the ACT component of, of that assessment. So they aren't sort of indicating that there are preparatory experiences outside of the fact that when our fourth and eighth grade science tests transition to their new next generation science K-Prep, 
they are, that's what they're referring to as this operational model. So the guidance for our high school teachers has been students need to be able to react to written um, prompts in ways that um, are sort of derived from li literature, pe like nonfiction pieces, like informational text, so to speak. And so that's gonna be a little bit different rather than straight content knowledge. It's basically putting the phone up and playing. Cor well, and reading. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. And so there's a lot of components to, to consider in the same format. So that's just one update. So that's part one. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're on to the second pickup. And this is, we, so there are two sets. I'm gonna flash forward for you. There's two here, okay. Two sets of academic standards that we are now getting right, actually three, uh, but we're on this page. Two sets of academic standards that we are preparing for for the next academic school year. So the state, uh, State, the Kentucky Board of Education has gone ahead and moved forward with the adoption of, of revised mathematics and reading and writing standards. So reading and writing is together, and then math is separate, so that's two. Um, so where, th where this stands is, we're not nervous about it because the content in these standards is the same. This is common core math, this is common core reading and writing. Uh, we have been a common core school district, <laughs> quite frankly state, for the past multiple years. So the actual standards themselves are not going to be new. Uh, what is new is essentially how those standards have been organized, how they have been um, put into like bands, and how they've been configured potentially in ways that the proposals would be teach in maybe a particular different order than what has been previously suggested. Uh, but the actual content itself is not different. So we're not nervous about that. We just will need to become reacquainted to the format of these standards. Um, you can see sort of on this timeline the process that this, um, that this has gone through. And so where we stand as, as we are here on February 11th is the Joint House and Senate are reviewing um, the Kentucky Board of Education's suggestion to move forward. And it is to be expected that this will certainly move forward in advance of the academic school year to follow um, and, and certainly be in law. So that's where the ELA and NAF stand. So the part that we probably would be more diligent and, and pay more attention to would be this component. So we are also um, going to be receiving new academic standards in social studies. These are, in fact, new. So, you know, you can't change history, like what happened in the past is the past, but the actual standards of which we are accountable for making sure that students are developing a, a level of mastery, these are changed. So we have been teaching from core content, social studies, for a long time. Um, and so this now has sort of developed in a, in a rather rapid succession because for years the state was reconstructing the social studies standards and then it kind of just got lost in the shuffle. There were too many other fun things happening. Um, and this ended up rising back to the top. So where we are here is the Kentucky Board of Education is all in. So they have pledged their support. They have approved these new social studies standards. They are really heading into the same trajectory as the reading and math are. So, I mean, it's happening. Um, where we are now is next month, in March, there will be this release. It's like a Google survey. And anybody in the state, you, teachers here, administrators, whomever, will have the opportunity to provide commentary, feedback on those standards that could potentially be applied towards um, like revisions before they are ultimately adopted into law. But, I mean, this is happening. And so we would want to be prepared moving into the next academic school year for new social studies standards. Um, so thinking about some of our school PD plans and things of that nature, we'd want to make sure we build in components of consideration to, to attend to those, to become oriented. So they, yeah, the content is certainly different. Yeah, and the, the outlay is certainly different. Um, the expectations for conceptual knowledge versus the pro procedural, uh, like process knowledge with these standards is gonna be quite different. Um, it's going to mirror that of kind of the next generation science standards with the sense of um, students being encouraged to think through the content rather than knowing rote pieces of knowledge. And so that's, that's probably one of the more significant changes. Oh, certainly. Yeah. I think the only issue is that they don't currently live in a place online where it's just easily accessible for anyone to go to and just review right now. It sort of has been posted, taken down been posted, taken down. And so that's difficult because now that this message is out there, like, hey, be ready, this, this, is, happen, this is taking place, we can't just automatically go pivot back online and go search for it if they're hidden right now. Um, they will soon be released, but um, right now it's a little bit of a mystery. I, I'm not familiar with 
the way they've maybe done these in the past, but does, does it sound a little fast to be doing this and then they will approve this law at some point April, May, and then we do it next year? So uh, potentially it's accelerated a little bit. I think, again, something that we can have, um, something that, you, that can lessen your anxiety would be that next year, one of two things are gonna happen. First of all, I don't know this, I'm sort of making this up. But next year, <laughs> we'll either have an assessment that these standards are based on that'll be field test oriented, meaning it'll just be sort of a practice test, or there will be no assessment next year at all. So the level of accountability lessens for the release of these standards. We don't have to be sort of nervous about that, so to speak. Right. And that probably is why it's probably a, a way by which this maybe fast mentality can be worked around. Yeah. So that's that little update. And then one more <laughs> would be, there are components of our accountability system that literally, even ever since I joined the team, that we have talked about as being new that are actually gonna be going through some changes again. Um, the first is growth. And if you recall, we were slightly irritated by the growth data that, that came about this past year. Simply, not we weren't irritated about our student performance, we were sort of annoyed by the reporting vessel and the way that you calculate that because it was almost like in hieroglyphics. Remember, it, it really wasn't something that we could follow in some sort of algebraic pattern. And so there's good news here. So this is good. A little bit before we were sort of you know, being down. We're happy about this. Um, the growth is going to be categorical growth from this point forward. Oh, well, this is proposed, by the way. So it's not, it's not in law yet. But um, so categorical growth would mean that we would receive credit for students maintaining their levels of proficiency or increasing levels of proficiency. And then conversely, we would be penalized if students were to drop in levels of proficiency, which isn't quite frankly our trend in Fort Thomas, right? So it's actually rather advantageous. Um, it sort of mimics what was in place in the prior system where students were put into like bands with one another and had to compete against each other the next year. It was very Hunger Games-like, and you know, if they beat more than 40% of the students in their band, then they got points towards their school or for themselves, and the rest of them didn't. Here, it's some straightforward growth. If you were proficient last year and proficient again, points for your school. If you were proficient last year, distinguished this year, extra points for your school. If you were proficient this year, but apprentice high <coughs> next year, you are reducing points for your school. That is happening. But that's so much easier to understand. So the growth part is gonna be a good thing. Hopefully this does, in fact, move forward. Uh, transition readiness. Transition readiness is actually going to be uh, reduced in its level of valor in the system. Uh, essentially, high school will remain. Uh, the expectation will be to be transition ready. So no changes to high school, okay? All that stuff we've ever talked about in all those columns. Just go ahead and disregard that. That's fine, that's still happening. That's still taking place. This is elementary, middle school. Elementary middle school was gonna have a transition ready. We didn't really even have it this year because it was gonna go live for fall 2019. Now it's off the chart, so it's not happening anymore. It's gonna be um, taken out. They received feedback that it was going to be very difficult to configure a score that would make sense, and uh, therefore they've decided to propose that that be excluded from consideration. Um, achievement gap closure is gonna also be redefined in a way much like growth. Again, it was a very difficult, uh, it was very tricky to compartmentalize how a school would calculate their growth closure. It was very complicated in nature. So they're going to, they're proposing that they move to a system much like growth, where it, growth, it's categorical, that's easy to explain. They want to go ahead and, and develop a system or a sort of a chart format where students will be able to progress through a trajectory on a continuum. Um, much like they would for growth, and that would be a favorable thing for, ac for achievement gap closure as well. Um, knowing that all of our schools and our district have an achievement gap closure goal that you approved last month, um, we certainly are set up to be successful in that endeavor. And then opportunity and access is the last one. This was sort of referring to what's your counselor to student ratio, right? This was how much time are students in different grade levels having access to uh, co-curricular activities such as you know library media specialists and or arts programming right practical living things of that nature so that's actually being proposed to be taken out and in its place will be school quality and culture school quality and culture being things that are typically publicly reported such as behavior incidents you know restraint and seclusion type situations what is the makeup of that school's um, uh, support structures and essentially now schools will be able to earn credit towards the accountability system for those domains um, giving credence to some of those things that take financial resources that boards and schools allocate 
um, for particular services. So that's probably also a nice uh, service for us to take advantage of too. So for assessment accountability, that's just a, a little bit of an update for now. Um, so all those sound what's good happening. to us. Uh, certainly, I th yes, I think that we could be advocates for each one of these changes here. Is this, an answer, is this an answer to the whole, I don't know, we want to be another, you know, the thing <laughs> that we're PSR and AR, you know, the two groups. Is this an answer to that when they looked at it and went, oh, there's no no other? And I will tell you that I think that the, you're onto something with transition readiness uh -huh. um, because transition readiness was definitely a, a big catcher for this TSI, CSI identification. Mm -hmm. So I would propose that with the omission of that as a considerable factor, that there would be less TSI and CSI designations. So you're likely it's connecting a lot of that. Yeah. You know? And I think it's been difficult for them to manage as yeah. well. And so potentially this is a way to focus resources and attention where it's truly needed. So. All right. Oh, so that's our timeline. So anyways, it's currently going to legislative committees for consideration. Um, and I, again, uh, right now, all, all, all points, everything points to those being moving forward as, as I described. So that's that piece. So I think now we'll move forward and I think you may have set me up for the next one. I think it's a, it might be a TSA update. I'm not sure, I don't remember. Oh, okay, we can do that next, all right. So a very, um, a very quick report on our winter star assessment <coughs> results. So we administered our STAR benchmark for the second time this year uh, during the time from December 10th through the 21st. We did so, of course, at the elementary and middle school level, and we did so also at the high school level for students with, um, di with disabilities to be able to progress monitor in that domain. Uh, because the, the number, the end number, isn't substantial enough to really give valid data to represent at the high school level, they're not depicted on this chart. Um, instead, we here are focusing on elementary and on middle school. So I'll point your attention to the very first chart. This is star reading. I'd already shared with you the first column when we talked about this in I th October, potentially. Um, the fall percent of proficient and distinguished students at each of our elementary schools, as well as elementary overall. And let's just go ahead and have middle school showing too, just so we can kind of look at reading all at one time, if we can. Okay. And then the column next to it, if you recall, is how our students performed at those schools on last year's K-PREP assessments. We were trying to make a comparison of proficiency. Mm -hmm. Of course, the comparison being that was the end of the year for students, whereas this was fall, beginning of the grade level years uh, for those schools. So apples to oranges, but same fruit salad, right? So then winter, the next column over, <laughs> Um, would be the winter percent proficient distinguished rating. So this is our fresh data. So if I read it to you, you're looking at 74.6% of students at Johnson Elementary School were proficient or distinguished on their reading star benchmark. Okay, and those are scaled and normed against our K-PREP exams. So there's a lot of correlation there. The piece of data that I felt was, was super relevant and very maybe interesting for you to reflect upon would be the last column today for this winter benchmark. And that is our student growth percentiles. So obviously, I, I know you are well aware of a percentile is out of a range of like 100, and it's looking at you know the, the percentage of students who performed at or below or above, uh, really at or below, um, these numbers. So if you look, for example, at Woodville, fi fi Woodville had a 57 percentile for reading, which means that they scored, that students on average scored better than 57% of other students um, who also completed the STAR benchmark in reading across the nation, like well, across all of those schools who, who take the, the STAR assessment. In growth, in growth, yeah. excuse me, for their growth uh, percentiles, I appreciate that. Um, and so, mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. And it's literally higher because um, the STAR, uh, the Renaissance Learning provides for us feedback about your schools or your district's performance correlated and compared to those around the nation. And so our student growth percentiles for both, well for all of our elementaries and our middle school did show high growth as compared to other students who also took those examinations. So I think that's quite admirable and something to be you know, very proud of as a mid-year check-in. For math, which directly follows, so same format, uh, but this is now referring to the mathematics assessment, you'll notice the same format, so we're reading this and we're reading Moyer Elementary School, 50.3% of students who, who were benchmarked in math 
uh, were proficient and distinguished at this time. Um, you're also reading across for the student growth percentiles. You're again seeing scores in the 50s and above, 50s and 60s. Um, and this point, at the middle school level, the percent student growth percentile, the 51, is ranged as high. It's indicated as a high, that's a high student growth percentile for the star reading, uh, star math benchmark. Um, and our elementary schools all fell within the moderate range um, for a benchmark score for growth percentiles. One, one piece of data that you may consider, uh, I know it's certainly if you have an education background, would be that in mathematics, the content is scaffolded in such a way that it builds throughout the academic school year, so skills and concepts build upon one another. The trajectory or continuum of what a student learns, let's just say in the fourth grade, it builds in complexity as the year progresses, whereas I'm not suggesting that it doesn't do so in reading, but the fundamental skills in reading are more cyclical. So a student's experience in fourth grade as it relates to like reading and writing is a little bit more repetitive in nature. They're still learning new skills. They're still having to learn um, how to be better at, at, at certain components of, you know, of, of just literature and, and literacy pedagogy. Um, but they do so in a way that's not as new as it is for math. So I would hate for you to, ha to have a takeaway of our proficient distinguished winter results and think, oh, those are, I'm really concerned, those are really low. We certainly are promoting growth in those areas. Those are now data points that we wanna attend to, not ignore, but at the same point, we have to understand that students may have and were likely asked questions by which they weren't prepared to respond to with any level of accuracy because they have not received that direct instruction. But wouldn't that be the same for the whole national uh, scope of those who are evaluated or no? I would, say, I would say yes, I think that's absolutely fair for sure, which is why you find us above the 50th percentile for growth still. I mean, our students are still growing as compared to their same age peers, right? Um, we just perhaps <coughs> in math didn't have the level of, of a growth percentile increase as we saw in reading comparatively. I think one of the things that um, the Kentucky Department of Education do is that our uh, cutoff for proficiency in Kentucky is very high for K prep. Um, and so it takes, what about the 90th percentile or so to be at that 92nd, to be at the proficiency level on K prep because of the very high standards for math in Kentucky. And so um, that, that's why math seems to be at a different level as well because that percentile is, percentage is so high, percentile is so high for Kentucky, for our K prep. Score are proficient. It's a, it's a good thing. I mean, it's for preparing our students, yes, but it is a very high marker. So well, I think it's certainly something to keep an eye on, though. Mm -hmm. Well, and luckily, our schools are equipped. They are already not only equipped, but they're already actively doing that. I mean, they have data teams that are certainly reviewing student performance trends uh, on an ongoing basis. And then we, as a school district, invested in sort of like star uh, renaissance 2.0 this year, which is not only do we have these three benchmark assessments by which we put our students through to track their progress three times throughout the course of the year, but students who potentially are not at proficiency or who are not making substantial growth in these checkups are put into more rapid um, monitoring probes in shorter increments of time. So instead of waiting now to the spring benchmark, which is like April, we have students who are going to make take these tests like every two or three weeks and students, or excuse me, the teachers and administrators will then review that data to ensure that we are seeing progress in their performance and that their trend is upwards, not either stagnant or falling behind. So we certainly have documentation. Sounds like we're being proactive. And then I will transition to uh, my other update tonight or discussion item, which is uh, our TSI plan update for Highlands Middle School. So we talked about um, for Highlands Middle School that you know as soon as the school was labeled as a TSI school targeted support and improvement, we collaborated um, in particular, uh, Josh Feldman, Michael Houghton, Summer Rosa, and myself, um, to indicate a plan of action, right, to really target the students of whom 
um, qualified us for that designation. The school, as you're well aware, through their CSIP last month, has a core program in place to address the needs of all students academically. So that's already taking place. Um, what we wanted to do is kind of target our support for the school as it relates to its TSI designation uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, we wanted to have documentation to indicate that we took that label seriously and that we wanted to make a difference um, in the school's performance trends to show that we were attending to the student needs that were persisting through our data. Um, the other would be we wanted to use as a learning opportunity for the educators, the administrators, the, you know, the teachers that are a part of the process so that we could improve our, um, our system that is in place to ensure that all students are achieving at the highest levels that they can. So the first part of that plan that we currently are, are is certainly in progress is we are increasing the progress monitoring, meaning we are checking on their data trends in increments of time that are much shorter than all students are. So in grades six, seven, and eight, students with disabilities in reading and math, we're giving these interim benchmark assessments every two weeks. And of course, all the work is happening at the middle school, I'm just reporting to you. So under Michael's leadership, uh, his teachers are ensuring that students um, in these subgroups are completing these benchmark assessments. They're documenting those results, they're actually even color coding them according to performance trends. And then the teachers are, which is actually on the next slide, but then they are responding to that data uh, in a very intentional way to look at closing skill gaps. So those assessments are happening with much more regularity. So we don't have to wait like, oh, let's just see how they do in, in the spring benchmark and maybe in April I'll give you good news. We're not, we're not gonna wait for April and hope for good news. We're actually gonna know every two weeks how students are doing uh, through the context of reading and math. So what, what's happening is um, through this regular review of student data trends, uh, they are taking a look at those uh, individual students and how they're performing, and then their teachers are actually determining individual acceleration plans to increase their achievement. So they have access to instructional reports. So based upon how students are performing on these assessments, essentially what questions are they getting wrong, that data gets extracted and put into a report that teachers can use to say, hey look, if you are able to attend to skills one through six with this student with some level of regularity, then potentially that student will then be able to demonstrate mastery the next time that he or she is then assessed. So it's a very strategic approach to working through skill deficits that have persisted clearly for students um, if, if they're in the subgroup and they've likely persisted for seven years since kindergarten, most likely, because um, they're pretty much foundational skills. Another thing to think about is just the instructional delivery method. So we are ensuring that students that are in our disability group in these grade levels for reading and math are getting some specific program implementation. So the school and district has, the school mostly has uh, instituted Reading Plus to support reading. So and, and exact math for math. One of the things that Summer, Michael, Josh, and myself have invested in is re uh, research-based um, academic support systems. We wanna ensure that the strategies that we're using and the methodology that we're implementing is very particular in a way that's research-based so that we actually have data to support that what we're doing, either strategically or program-wise, is actually gonna make a difference in student performance. We went to a particular training for that through the state. We asked questions at that state meeting. Um, we got some answers. Uh, and then we, you know, we definitely embedded that into our plan of action. Uh, the collaboration is happening between our general ed and special education teachers. And then those students that are impacted by this consideration have had their schedules changed to ensure that they're receiving support and intervention as needed in those contexts. So there's been a lot of things happening under certainly Michael's leadership um, to ensure that you know, we're paying attention to that detail. Um, the other thing that's happening is that we are meeting regularly to monitor the progress of the school, uh, not to monitor the progress, to check in on the school and see how, it, how and, and what they may need for support. Um, for example, the next step that we're taking is that Summer and I are going to meet with a continuous improvement coach from the Kentucky Department of Education, either this week or the last week of February, I can't recall, and we are going to consult with her on our TSI plan, uh, and we're gonna be able to get some feedback from that person, and, and really also some buy-in. It's also sort of our chance to say, hey, we're, like, we're really paying attention to this. Like, you know, we really are trying to be better, and so we, we wanna make sure we use that. Um, next steps for the school would be, how do they replicate this system that I've just described to you, also in social studies, and also in writing, right? Just to expand beyond just reading and math. They've focused a whole lot on reading and math, so they've pledged to sort of think through what can they do 
to really focus on, on writing and social studies. Specifically, how do they target that writing instruction for students in areas where progress is limited? Um, and then also some explicit instruction on demand. We want our students to be fluent writers, period. We want them to be able to express themselves regardless of how they're being asked to do so. But we also recognize that we're assessed through on demand. So we want students to be able to have a sense of comfortability in responding to on demand um, with some level of proficiency. So that's important and we've embedded that into our plan. So again, this is the work's happening at home in middle school. I just wanted to report to you on the progress um, and to know that we're certainly attending to that designation and, and making an effort. And seeing progress, I should probably also say and that. that's what I was gonna ask too. Are the kids seeing yeah. their progress? Are they so this is where they started and much more fluent since 2011 or 2012. Yeah. So I don't know, M Michael, I'm not <coughs> I would say a huge level of support has been the teachers also doing the track. I mean, yes, that, that is critical and super important and I'm glad it is happening and he could articulate that, but also the teachers being really fluent in how students are performing on two week trends has also been, I think, instrumental to their plan and, and for them to really be aware of not just how they're performing holistically, but how they specifically performing. That's been powerful. Any questions? you all right next uh discussion discussion item on the uh agenda is superintendent's report i think we're going to talk about portugal graduate instructional blueprints well, we are out here tonight. yeah we do a lot of amazing people uh teachers and administrators in our district and community members and we're very excited uh for them to present some of the work that they've been doing over the last several months uh we could not we knew that the next step uh, with our portrait graduate is to take it beyond just a nice graphic that's on the wall or on the shelf uh, to actually to actualize it. To, so to first to describe what each of these competencies are and to create some uh, frameworks, instructional blueprints, so that it can make it more clear to teachers and for teachers to uh, be able to work with in designing instruction. And so we'll turn it back over to Bill, who has been working with them, each of these committees of uh, people who have volunteered hundreds of hours uh, to make this happen. So, so on, only momentarily for me. Um, we are so happy to be able to have uh, teachers and administrators here tonight to be able to share with you the work that's been happening. Uh, I think it's really important that you understand that it's a work that's also going to be considered work in progress. They have now developed drafts. And so what we charged these committees with is we said, we did, you know, here we came up with these competencies, we unveiled them, we said go play with them, we, this is teachers, we said go play with them, tweet all about it, internalize it, make meaning in and of yourself. Um, but concurrently, we wanted to start working on a tool that we could provide to teachers by which they could conceptualize and better understand the meaning behind what these competencies are. And that meaning we wanted to derive from our people themselves. Um, you know, the mastery of understanding students and what we want students to be able to do comes from within our five building walls. So we wanted to utilize that strength and that passion, that expertise to put together what has been commonly referred to as like a rubric. We're not using that language. We are using the word instructional blueprint um, because essentially these are, this is guidance for teachers. We want teachers to feel confident knowing that, hey, look, I'm on board, Portugal graduate, I'm into it. And so as I focus on courageous leadership in my classroom, give me some direction on what that means. Because I can do that in the, in the frame of my own context. I want to do that in the frame of the context of the district. So as a district, we created these instructional blueprints to navigate our teachers through the meaning, the significance of these competencies and specifically through particular skills. So here's how this is going to be unveiled tonight. We're excited about this. Um, we're going to have each committee come up one at a time and they're each going to just share with you how did they come up with their instructional blueprints? What process did they go through? How did they determine those core essential skills that they have? What sort of um, research did they do to determine the language that they used across the continuum for their blueprints? So they're gonna talk you through that briefly. Then uh, concurrently, we're gonna show you, we're actually gonna display the blueprint for their particular committee so you can see what it looks like. Again, it's in draft form. We will end up sharing these with our school district at large post meeting tonight. 
And when we do that, we'll be doing that for the remainder of the school year and welcoming additional feedback and input in advance of the next academic school year. So this is not a done deal. This is not an encyclopedia that we now have to all go use and reference. This is just a starting point for us on a continuous improvement plan that we have in place for multiple years ahead. Um, then, at the conclusion of their shareouts, we are going to debut um, our portrait or graduate competency video for each competency that we've been working really hard to um, put together, and we hope that you'll feel very proud of, of those um, final products. So I think we should start with our Courageous Leader Committee. So we have uh, Carrie Yates and Patrick Richardson are going to come back up as chairpersons, and they are going to be joined by Susie Vetter um, from Moyer Elementary School. Yes. To talk to you. I think the most exciting part about this is that all of these instructional blueprints go hand in hand with the term terminology we've been using with growth mindset. Whenever our students and our teachers see these, students can fall at different levels, at different days, different weeks, and throughout different years. So they may be able to say, okay, here's where I am right now, but this is how I can grow in that area. And we need to make, make it known to our students, they're not expected to be innovating or level four, so I'm getting used to those terms, but they're not expected to be at the innovating level in every category and at all times. So how do they grow? Because we see that our students get so comfortable in those areas where they are innovating. So getting them to see, I'm in the introducing stage here and here's what I have to do to make changes there. So when we came together as the Courageous Leader, we started out just with the word leader. What is a leader? What does a leader say? What does a leader do? And what does a leader not do? And we used post-its to come up with things and then we found trends within those post-its to come up with our categories. So our first two here being social well-being and emotional well-being. A leader has to know who they are and what their vision is and how they feel and their thoughts and their actions before they can go out and spread that to others as well as have others join them in making um, leadership opportunities. So those are our first two competencies that we are skills under our competency. Um. We were really, when we were thinking about this, we were really thinking about three prongs. The first one being well-being and social well-being, emotional well-being. The second prong that I'm going to talk about is future focus. When we met at the public house and, and we talked to those, those business leaders, a lot of it was sort of, a lot of the feedback that we were getting was, what, what are these, what are our, our students' vision? So a lot of what we talked about was, how, did we, how do we develop students that have a vision both understanding what their interests are, what their skills are, but what they're going to be doing uh, when they leave us. You know, so often in education, we get so, I think we get sort of stuck, okay, we've got them here, what are we doing with them today? Um, but we have a little bit harder time thinking about what happens when they leave us. So as a competency, we want to get our kids thinking much, much more about what am I going to be doing after I leave and, and when I'm employed and what, what's going to be my post-secondary? education going to look like before they leave us and not trying to figure that out later. If they figure it out later, that's fine. But let's work a little bit harder at, even in kindergarten, starting to look at what can, what can, what do you need to be doing to develop those interests, those skills, to develop that vision. So that's really the, the number three and number four, looking at future focus. Then our last skill that we focused on was having those leadership skills and opportunities. And we thought at the beginning level that they would be mostly teacher directed and giving them the opportunities to help out in the classroom and the school and moving towards more of the community and outreach. But then we want them in the higher levels to be self um, initiating those skills and be able to find those opportunities on their own to be involved, not only in the school, but also in the community as well. And I think our rubric goes really well with the leader in me. If you wanted to kind of speak. Well, I think it's the whole thing. I mean, yeah. just, you know, the courageous leader of moving kids from kind of this idea of leadership to, you know, using it when you get older, when you get out of school or when you're, you know, college, even so forth, 
you know, even in elementary school, but just applying it to kind of everyday roles um, and different, you know, chances that you have in life. together at the same time and start working on this? We broke it up into those three different skills and then had subcommittee and other committees. <laughs> we tried to make sure that each small committee within our committee represented um, elementary, middle, and high because this will be ongoing throughout their um, school career. We also wanted counselors or psychologists and then also what was really neat to um, hear from is our teachers that are parents and to hear from a parent looking at this, this is how I feel about it because it would change those conversations to have those different um, perspectives. So that was really cool. We just made sure those were spread out in each of these subcommittees. The other thing we, we wanted to make sure that we had was we, we wanted parents um, throughout the development levels, young kids, kids who are in middle school and high, and, and parents that are, had, had uh, kids graduate. So we're looking at all those different ranges. And I'll just say, if you want to talk a little bit about how you got down to these particular uh, descriptions, I know you've used tons of, you've met many, many times, and there's a, a, a ton of resources you've used and, and so right. on. We, we did meet many times. We looked at a lot of different rubrics, if you were, different blueprints from other schools. Um, and, and we used some of that, but, but actually the majority of it, I think, was, was more homegrown. Homegrown looking at what are businesses looking for. I think that was really the question that we often were asking ourselves, what are businesses looking for in, in students once they leave us? And you know, obviously they're looking for people who can work with people, that's, that's that first line. The next piece is they're looking for people who can overcome adversity. Um, you know, that, that is so huge in, in our blueprint is what is your ability to, to, to work and overcome this situation when it's not going well for you? Um, so we wanted to make sure that we, we got a huge thread of that in there. Um, and then a lot of you know, future focus. It's what are you going to be doing when you leave us? Um, because again, like I said, I, I think sometimes we get really stuck on test scores and things like that. Test scores aren't going to get you a job. It's what's your ability to, to work with other people, what's your ability to overcome adversity, what's your ability to, to have a vision. And, and if we can give our kids this uh, through this blueprint and, and bring them heads and tails better than, than where they would be if they were not focused on that. So. And these were all consistent whenever we talked through the different grade levels, elementary, middle, and high. <coughs> we were all having those same conversations. This is what we see our kids, they get frustrated when they get a 98 because they want a 100. Like how do we get them to move past that? They're taking three hours on a test because they don't want to get any question wrong. It's like, turn it in, a 98 is going to be okay if you did great, but some kids see a 98 and that's not good enough for them and they shut down and they, you know, and so we just want to make sure that we help them overcome that. And so those were consistent conversations across all grade levels. So we felt if we're all seeing that, how can we put that into a rubric to assist all of our students? You know, I think a lot of that is, um, it's a real paradigm shift. I say this gingerly, but I think a lot of that can be apparent driven as well, that 98 is not good enough. And I don't know culturally how you manage that and how we can work with kind of both of those type of uh, demands. But this is, this is extremely valuable. And this is kind of where it's going in the future, in my opinion, which doesn't mean a lot, but it's what I see in the business world. Let's put it that way. It's what I've seen out of my own experiences from my experiences with my kids. And it's, it's got to be this way, I believe. Why don't we give you room to go? And then if there's any additional questions we can ask after that. When we began the process of coming up with Fort Turner for Graduate and Fort Thomas Independent Schools, we really thought about what are the skills that students need when they leave us here at Fort Thomas. We had to build in what our five competencies were that we wanted to focus on. What are those big hitters that our students will need for lifelong skills? A courageous leader is a child that can not only go in and do something for themselves, but they can reflect on a situation and how they can extend that to others. They have a connection with who they are, who they want to be, and what their future goals are. When they haven't met a goal or something happens and there's a conflict,
they're able to identify their feelings and then make the next steps in order to continue on. I just love the direction that we're headed with the district. I think we're setting our kids up for their future success. What I love about what we're doing is we are going through the leader me process. We're developing lifelong skills and they can make those connections to the work that they're doing. We're seeing that those are things that are certainly attainable for our kids even at the kindergarten through fifth grade level. The ability to develop leadership skills, develop social and emotional skills, and having an understanding of where that student wants to be after they leave us. That's really what the employers are looking for. They're looking for students who have an understanding of what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses. They're looking for students who understand themselves emotionally and can overcome adversity. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop students in the 21st century. That's good stuff. So we, we actually want to recognize you further for the work that you have done. Um, so we kind of we kind of we kind of group this a little bit differently. Um, so for for our instructional blueprint, blueprint on creative problem solving, um, this process started of course last year, and we worked through a lot of different skills on it. But I like I want Heidi to elaborate more on the the behind the thinking of where where we're coming from um, for for this uh, blueprint. And I'll talk about the process where um, Stephanie's actually going to talk about like the the thinking behind what we came up with here. So we're going to kind of go opposite here. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, so uh, I think the big inspiration for creative problem solving came um, from a lot from design thinking. Um, so a lot of the sources that we looked at were, um, and stop me if I'm stepping on your toes. No, no. You're fine. Okay. So um, we looked at like the D school model for design thinking, and um, they use a lot of empathy and um, discussion of defining the problem. And then you try to um, really create divergent thinking. Um, by using idea development, ideation, and prototyping and that kind of thing. So uh, we used a lot of that and then we stumbled upon um, some work by Ian Jukes who is a really great researcher and is really good at sort of condensing things down, lots of information down for people. And he had a model that just really resonated with us um, with all, all these Ds. And so we, uh, we, we sort of, yeah, we sort of went with the alliteration like good teachers do. And, um, and so uh, looking at that and um, other models like by Mitch Resnick, um, I just think it all sort of came together um, into our creative problem solving. So. Okay. okay, so I was just gonna go through some of the competencies that we um, came up with as a committee. Discover is the part where the students just um, are able to identify the problem or the task and clearly state it. And I found that interesting across all of our um, grade levels. Mm -hmm. We found that that is probably the most challenging part right now for our students is where we see in this process. Um, it's just what is the problem and how are we gonna go about doing it um, or solving it. 
So, and the dream and design is where with guidance and support and eventually we hope that they're able to take the initiative and find, um, demonstrate ways to explore ideas, engage in that design thinking process that Heidi just described, um, and just be open to feedback. Dive in is when they can get in there and get that flexible thinking. Um, let's see, working with clarity, collaborating with others, um, and just being able to um, conquer some of their challenges. And then delivering their actual product, coming up with an original solution or something that's unique that will solve the problem. And then the final section that we talked about is debriefing and being able to receive feedback, um, eventually seek out expert advice of ways they can make their solution even better and continue on with that. So those were the competencies that we um, ended up identifying for this blueprint. I, and I think this, like our district, is in terms of um, where we are with innovation and, and creativity and having kids do things that, that no other districts can even touch on the national level, um, we're a lot years ahead. This, this blueprint, this framework is going to allow people who in a classroom would never consider, because it's content agnostic again, so it's not for any content, it's like, how can I start this now? Like, how might I integrate this into a science class? Or what might this look like in a literature class? And um, I think it's a really powerful thing we've taken on as a school district because one, we're recognizing these skills are of value, and we already are high performing academically. We know that, that that's our rich and tradition. We're, you know, we're excellent at that. But what if we add these pieces, and, and that's the thing that can really set the, the next wave. If you look at that last column, and I'll just leave you with this today, where we have the innovating column, the ultimate, this is, will be our, um, the ultimate goal for, our, for any, any student here will be that they, they reach out with outreach. They create something that's innovates, that, that goes above and beyond, and in the very bottom, of course, they're connecting to critical feedback from multiple sources, including experts outside of the school. So that's that component we want our students to be able to do. Um, and this process was really a, a great process for us because we're able to connect K to 12. And sometimes it's really hard when you work in a high school, you don't always get to talk to someone who's an expert in elementary. So it's been a very, very cool, cool thing to come together and I'm excited to, to see where we'll take it. Most recently, our fourth class independent school implemented a new approach with Portrait of a Graduate. With that, we have five competencies, and those competencies have made a great addition to our teachers' planning, our student engagement, as those connect with the learning and the educational experiences within our community. As a school district, we want students to be creative problem solvers, and that means putting their own imagination and creative ideas towards solving problems that have obstacles or challenges in the real world. Giving students the opportunity to explore ideas, to research, and to think critically about it, and then to bring in a creative problem solving element in an authentic way really helps them see that they can make an impact in the world, and that's what we want them to do. I think one of the most exciting and amazing things about our students is they always surprise me with what they can come up with. I think our teachers are very supportive of our students and they love new and creative ideas and they're always looking for ways to get the students involved. When we talk about elementary to middle school to high school, we're trying to create a graduate that is ready for the real world we don't really know what it's going to look like. By implementing things under the umbrella of creative problem solving, we're able to build skill sets that will serve these students regardless of what they pursue once they graduate. Getting students to understand that large Fortune 500 and even smaller companies are looking for candidates who can think outside a box and be innovative and think of new ways to do things that we have done for a hundred years. We really try to focus on how can students be creative and be innovative and be prepared for jobs that they don't even know exist yet or know that they want. 
Over the years of my placement here within the district, from teacher, principal, and now district administration, I can recognize that we've taken innovation to the next level. We take our laptops or our iPads daily within the classroom and engage students into the curriculum and the content and explore opportunities outside of the four walls. Yeah, so uh, thank you for allowing us to present. Uh, you know, this was just like all the other groups said, this was really a, a long process that we've kind of gone through. So, uh, you know, I really think back to when we started, gosh, way, way back. Um, it really just kind of started off with just what were we looking for. And so we really spent a lot of time saying, you know, what skills is that we want our students to be able to, to work. And we really kind of started with that learning target type atmosphere. And so we created like three specific learning targets our students will. Uh, and so really came up with, from that, came up with these ideas, right? We want our students to be able to, Brian Mercer was a part of our group, and I think I remember that day in the library where we kind of came up with this idea of wonder. And we really felt like it was an, an issue where we want our students to just kind of have that intrinsic motivation to try to find out what it is that they're looking to do. And from that point on, we were really able to spurn on the rest of our ideas of discover reasoning perspective and reflection. And so when we talk about a curious, critical thinker, we're really getting that kid to um, self-initiate, find those passions within, and then to move forth and, um, find answers to those problems and to be willing to look at multiple sources and multiple sides of an argument to help them better have a better understanding of what it is to help them uh, derive and come up with the best solution. I think part of our challenge was to um, not only just finding a meeting time and location, we were able to accomplish that really well, but you know, this group sat back together multiple times and said, all right, how can we make this work from a K-12 continuum? And not just think about this from an elementary standpoint, but from a you know, junior, senior, and high school, how can we make this fit? And so you know, we had a lot of really smart people in the room, and so I just really got out of the way and let them do a lot of the work, because <laughs> they're way smarter than I am on a lot of these things. But uh, you know, we were, at the end of the day, we're really proud of our work, and I feel like we've got a, a great blueprint for our students to uh, become curious and critical thinkers. Did a really good job explaining that. Um, he also gave us candy bars when we were finished um, because we spent so much time together. It was like a reward. Um, and Keith kind of talked about this, but I think the easiest one, you know, wonder, discovery, reasoning, perspective, and reflection for, for curious and critical um, thinkers. I think the easiest one and the most, you know, when we think of critical thinking, it's probably a really traditional school value that, you know, is not like a new and innovative idea. Um, so the reasoning line was probably the easiest for us and the one that maybe we kind of took some from some already developed um, portrait of a graduate type of um, blueprints. Um, but the ones that were really hard for us to sort of um, articulate were the wonder and the discovery. And, you know, what does that look like for teachers to bring that into their classroom? So we really kind of agonized a little bit over that. And I like the progression of ours that it really goes from students um, you know, being critical thinkers with the things that we give them to then moving to then create, like thinking of their own, what they want to look into and what are they curious about. And then it, it really moved, ours I feel like moved from like a local application to a more, a larger audience to a global application. So I like that we 
we're able to incorporate that into it. I'm going to use that word impact, right? So I think making impact on a lot of our things was kind of a, a key theme for us. So it's <coughs> beyond just the knowledge base. Our kids play school really well, but it's building something to have an impact is kind of where we really try to live in that, in that final column. So if we can get our kids to do that, I think that's pretty incredible. I would like to add, I, as, as I listened to the last group that did the um, problem solving, there's a lot of overlap between this and the problem solving. So I don't think that these are really standalone kind of traits that the students are learning. And the other thing that I would hope that when they work their way through this process and they get down to the reflection that that's then generating ideas that's then it's cyclic in nature because now they're going to start wondering again when they start reflecting on the process like what's the next thing that you know what what kind of questions do I have now that I need to wonder about so I think there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of cyclic um, patterns too. So. I think I'll just add that it's an opportunity with all of these competencies for them to take ownership of their learning. And so we're able to put on paper how, what we want the students to be able to do and take ownership and be accountable for their own learning. I think the big discussion that we talked about was that, like Keith said, they're good at playing school, but now how are you gonna move the, through that, that continuum? Um, I, think, I think we challenge, or we, we had a challenge of, we saw that there was gonna be a progression horizontally, but we found ourselves going through a, a continuum vertically as well. Um, so we tried tried to step away from that, yet we ended up kind of falling into it as well. So it, we, through any problem we found ourselves going through the wonder, discovery, reason, perspective, and, and reflection, so. I think Pat makes a good point that even though that process is right. linear down, yeah. I think it is cyclical. Mm -hmm. so, and, and to your point of our, our, ki our kids yeah. play school well, and so when they look at this, those that play school well, and I can't, I think it was Kara that talked about the 98 and that kind of thing, they want, what's my number here? And so it's getting them away from that thinking, you see this more as skills, and it's not as, it's not as right to make, this is life kind of thing. Well, and it gives them an opportunity to see, hey, where right. can I go now? Right. If I got a 98, I might be around here, so what can I, what's my next step? puts on paper where they can go. When we started coming up with Portrait of a Graduate, I instantly wanted to get on the committee. I'm really proud of being a part of Fort Thomas Schools because it's no longer maybe about the test as much. It's more about creating an environment that is receptive for students to be successful in their future. Curious and critical thinking is one of the competencies that we really want our students to develop. And the critical thinking part has long been a part of our tradition here. We have been committed to developing students who can use logic and reasoning and use analysis. Within that, we're trying to create a sense of wonder and discovery and not losing that curiosity. We're really trying to offer more student choice and allow them to wonder and then continue on to that critical thinking aspect where then they're using their logic and reasoning and analysis and really putting all of those things together. What are you curious about? They are asked to wonder. It's okay not to know, but it's not okay to not want to know or want to find out. Provide these opportunities for students to take risks and reach to find out answers. And that's what a curious critical thinker is, someone who's looking to find answers. Before it was just about the textbook and the learning and us being the purveyor of the knowledge and handing it over to kids. Now we're providing opportunities, and it's opportunities unlike we've ever done before, and that's what Portrait of Graduate's about, and that's why I'm excited as an administrator and as a father. I just
just want to say too, I like the last two on these because it talks about looking at other people's perspectives and looking at other ways of doing things. I think so many of our kids also think that there's one way and they get in there. So to have those two things where they see, it, it opened my eyes, help me understand, oh, that way's okay too, and that way's okay, and my way's still okay. So I, I think that's really important in the environment that we find ourselves in, those last two are really important. I think we had the largest group to committee total, and we have the smallest amount of people here tonight. Um, so we we did, yes. and we that was one thing we looked at each other, and we were like, we really need to talk about the parent involvement in this committee. Um, we had several parents that were excited to do this work with us. They saw a need for helping their students understand other perspectives and to be able to work together um, in a collaborative spirit to achieve um, some problems or to work on a project, whatever the case may be. So we did have really good parent support in our committee meetings. We had some, some changeover a little bit with our committee, so we, we were struggling, I think, to kind of um, meet with each other, but we did, we did get this together, and we came up with three um, big ideas that incorporate smaller kind of sub-concepts. Um, so we, th we thought about what it means to work together and how you have to be able to uh, keep an open mind, understand other people's perspectives, but also receive feedback um, in a meaningful way. So for the receiving um, characteristic, we, we thought about things like having a growth mindset, having a mindset for group work, setting group norms, and then also receiving that and giving feedback. Um, the sharing component, we discussed um, this idea of cooperation and conflict resolution, which a lot of times um, our students struggle with, with solving problems within the group and they really want to bring the teacher into that when, when we're trying to help them resolve those problems together in a meaningful way. Um, and then the last part is the designing aspect of collaboration. Um, so this would be like setting goals as a group, having individual roles and tasks to be completed, um, planning and contribution to the group thinking. So really when moving across, you're thinking like for introducing and integrating um, the teachers kind of showing students different roles or assigning roles or assigning groups. And by the time they get to innovation, they're choosing groups based on their strengths or weaknesses. Um, they're able to delegate jobs knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses. So moving from more teacher-centered group-based work to students actually um, being like the, the majority of that process. And I think something that our group focused on a lot, what, because of how diverse our background was with having so many parents involved with our group, was we realized as a group that the, this idea of collaboration was really important to that next step of success in the real world. Because if you can't empathetically collaborate with people, you're not going to be as successful in life. So we spent a lot of time thinking and discussing what it meant to be empathetic and creating that shared vocabulary of what empathy is and also what collaboration looks like. Because that's a skill that's really hard to kind of op observe and quantify. So we spent a lot of time really hammering out what those details looked like and what we were looking for at several different levels. And the parent, one of the parents on our committee was actually doing something similar in her job at PNG. So it was really cool to see that come full circle. Um, so she had a lot of information to give us based on you know what she observes in the workforce and her thoughts and ideas. We did look at other frameworks, uh, portrait of a graduate type frameworks to kind of help us steer us on the right path. Uh, but we were just talking before, and I, and I know Pat mentioned this, but I feel like with this particular uh, competency that it's a mixture of all of them. 
um, coming together as a group and you have to be a courageous leader, you have to be a critical uh, creative problem solver. So I feel like it's one of those kind of fluid and organic type, um, type um, of characteristics or components, so. I A year in the making to this point. I mean, it's really crazy. I mean, Angie will remember we were at Ed Leader 21, October 2017, uh, several people in the room, and, and said, hey, how could we do something like this? And they had this brilliant idea of let's, let's, let's expand the committee. Let's add to it. Let's have these task groups, and uh, let's go visit and see what other people are doing, and that sort of thing. And um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm blown away by your all's work. I mean, and to think that this was a year ago, just starting this input. Um, and so I think it's been a variety of ways. So some people were on those because we had those initial committees. Some have been on since those community conversations. Some have just seen it somewhere and said, hey, can I be a part of that? Um, and we, it's always been like this big tent, right? So anybody who yep. wants to be involved, you, you really want them. And the work's not finished, I have to keep saying that. Mm -hmm. But because, you know, we'll continue to add to these, give feedback, make them continue to sort of polish. Uh, but then think about what does this look like for students when they're doing this and, and these, uh, you know, collecting information about that. So it'll be an ongoing process. Yeah. But. continue to learn about what uh, education needs to be. We're figuring out that there are competencies that students really need in order to be successful. Opportunities for students to communicate, collaborate, be leaders, critically think, solve problems. All of those pieces in a more deliberate and more intentional way than what we've done in the past. Empathetic Collaborator means a couple of different things. We not only want students to be able to work together to create products or to solve problems, but they also need to be able to understand and appreciate other perspectives. I think adding the empathy factor really hones in on this idea that we are different, but that's okay, and that we need to learn to respect each other's differences. We're just trying to get students to be comfortable sitting together and, and working together and learning how to go through that process. Even if they've had conflict in the past, they can kind of try to work through that together. at is not just the technological tools that we use for collaboration. What's important about the empathetic part is what effective personality are they going to bring to it. It's not enough to just communicate, but you have to also keep in mind if I'm the receiver of the message, how am I going to take that message? Am I going to be open? Am I going to be mindful? Provide a response that is not just for the sake of providing a response, but going to be helpful for the person on the other end. So I think you'll kind of find that ours ties very nicely to the previous, the collaborator. And I feel like I can speak for the whole group when I say that you, it's not hard to get people excited about this one because across the board everyone said, oh my goodness, we need our kids to be able to communicate. 
And so we started broad picture. What do they need to be able to do? And so we made a list of everything they should be able to do from emailing appropriately to texting their friends, what does that look like, to having a face-to-face -face conversation with a professor, to writing a senior portfolio. And we listed all of those things. Um, and then we broke off and we studied the rubrics that already exist, um, Ed Leader 21, Asia Society, other organizations that have already created those communication rubrics. And we all looked at our respective levels. Um, we had all grade levels represented as well. And then we pulled out the must-haves, the things that we thought were the highlights. Um, from that point on, we did a little bit of soul searching, met with our teams at our local schools. Um, yeah, drew some pictures, <laughs> did some thinking, um, and we kind of came to the same realization the other groups. What we didn't want to do is create a to-do list for teachers of you're going to make this writing portfolio and you're going to teach them how to have these sets of skills, um, but really give teachers a freedom to enhance their craft. What are the standards you're already doing and how can you build these and interweave these in? Um, and so we came upon, upon these four areas, um, starting with listening. So you'll see that the first two levels are more um, that conversational skill, everything from body language and eye contact, um, how to listen with empathy, um, how to just get meaning out of what you're doing. And then it transitioned in those higher levels to how do you really um, take what you're hearing from a diverse audience and really change your mindset. So we're beyond that just listening and understanding, um, and now we're taking action. We're um, pulling from multiple perspectives. And so that, that second half is really kind of the different piece of just I'm hearing you versus I'm listening to you. I think you're next. I am. Um, I think we really tried to take into consideration what other committees did. It was all content, all grades, all the time. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter if this was a kindergartner or a fifth grader or a high school or my kid in college. This is where we wanted them to fall. And like Kara mentioned earlier, you can fall one place one day and the next day you're on to a different task and you're in a different cell and how do you move forward going from there. So in writing, um, I feel that we have taken great pride in this district in producing writers who can really achieve at high levels at the collegiate level. How do we get them there? That's by recognizing their audience, choosing their purpose, their topic, their form, conveying that message, taking audience needs into consideration, revising, reflecting, and then making that real for whoever's receiving the message. And it's neat to see that in the classroom. They're working on projects in library right now. And I've got two who are creating a flyer to put in Campbell County Library. And the discussions that they had they were talking about font, they were talking about format, they were talking about size of text, they were talking about color, they wanted position on paper, white space. It was all phenomenal conversations to convey a message that they wanted to get across. So that's what we want our kids to do. When we were considering what is conversation, what do we want our graduates to be able to do, we started throwing out big ideas and we thought that they needed to converse truthfully and positively and they need to be able to ask probing questions and value the opinion of others. And then they also need to reflect on the conversation and know how to have a conversation in diverse environments and in other languages when applicable. And we felt strongly about the other Yes. <laughs> Very strongly. <laughs> and even though our verbs on the, well, they're not, well, they are verbs, but <laughs> even though they're not necessarily um, in order, like we don't necessarily think you have to listen to be able to write, to be able to converse, but we do believe that you do have to do those three things before you can get to the final uh, competency, which is to be able to present your information in a public forum or to a small group. And I did want to point out, if you can't see it, um, that the last column, the innovating column in all four of these skills is involves feedback. It involves seeking feedback of others and making changes based on that feedback. And so in the present column, we think that they will get to that level when they have realized um, their and taken the feedback into consideration as they are working on their presentations. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a level of maturity, um, as with all the competencies, but the first two are pretty much 
first focusing on that circle of control, what can I do to communicate? And then the second two are moving on what's coming at me from the outside, right. how am I gonna handle it, what am I gonna do with it? In an appropriate way. Right. <laughs> I think our conversation was we live in a bubble in Fort Thomas and I raised my children specifically in this bubble but yet I knew given my personal family background that the world was larger and they had to succeed in that world outside of this city this state this country they have to be able to succeed in a different country and have a skill set for that country and so we were kind of taking all of those into consideration where you really have to allow and seek feedback and be able to converse. And it might just be through facial expression. At first, we just went to France as a family and there was a lot of two days of pointing, <laughs> but we finally figured it out through various methods. And so that's what we were seeking, to be able for them to get to that kind of level and understand there's somebody beyond you and us. There's a world, and you need to seek that and understand that. And the words we use for personal bias is right. to help our students and our, to learn their own personal biases that they might have about their living experiences in a bubble. of living <laughs> in a bubble. <laughs> These competencies are so important because it's more than just learning how to behave in school or learning how to do school. It's more about learning how to be an individual and learning how you learn best and what you need to grow in the 21st century. Just having a great mindset for learning. I think global communication is a very important part of our portrait of a graduate, which includes listening as well as speaking, communicating with people across the world. We expect our graduates to be able to go out in the world, speak at least one other language, be able to collaborate, talk to other people from anywhere in the world, empathize with them. I think that's a huge part of a global communicator. They have to learn to listen with the intent to understand. And I think that being exposed to a different language and being exposed to different cultures, you can't help but see that people are just like us. The global piece is all about being connected to the world around you, so we really want students to feel like they are connected to others outside of the walls of the school that they're in. The communicator piece has a lot of levels to it, everything from listening to speaking, presenting. This global communicator competency is so large in that it encompasses just how to be a leader in your communication skills. So really this is just going to encompass all those things that would make kids be able to communicate with others on a day-to-day -day basis, but also in a more formal setting. We want students to be culturally sensitive. We want to make sure that we produce students who are ready for the global economy at a rate that is more highly proportionate than our neighboring school districts and other states across the country. We want to produce the best students and prepare them for the future the best way we can. Thomas Independent Schools are a nationally recognized school district. We are very proud of all the ratings and ranking systems that make us number one. From number one in niche.com to U.S. News and World Report gold medal rankings, we excel. I think one of the most special attributes of the Fort Thomas Independent Schools 
are the instructors themselves and the integration with our community. What you really see and what you experience is a lot of integration between our schools and the families themselves. The demonstration of care and concern that the teachers give to our students on a daily basis goes really above and beyond what you would find in school districts across the state and nation. But we said yes and. Yes, we can continue to be a shining light in our community and prepare our students for the future workplace. Our Board of Education challenged us to determine what is it that all of our students need to be globally competitive, to be global leaders. The Ports River Graduate is a collaborative effort from everyone in our community. What do our kids need in order to be successful in this world? The Ports River Graduate really is about developing that whole person to say whatever I'm challenged by in the future, whether it's personal, professional, I have the skills to figure out the solution or to solve the problem. that Dr. Chester has done along with her staff, Portrait of a Graduate is off and running. The school board is fully behind that effort and really sees that as the opportunity to give students much more opportunity. What other options can we give them to really help them in their fields in whatever field they may choose? Yeah, thank you. I was just going to say thanks for your time tonight. I appreciate you giving us your Monday evening on a school night. I know you're very busy. Uh, we appreciate that. I mean, you really are the backbone for this ranking that we get, and, and uh, we appreciate how you really are diving into the portion of a graduate work. I mean, it's great to see that you are the ones creating this, and you're the ones that are going to be doing it. So, we really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thank you for tonight, and yeah, thanks for all of you there. Thank you, Joseph. We do appreciate you coming tonight. We're going to wrap up real quick, but if you have to go, feel free. Uh, <laughs> 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 They're out of here. Okay.
just like you give me a snow day or something. <laughs> no, no, no stuff. Uh, any uh, board committee updates? I don't think we had anything meet. <laughs> uh, final uh, item tonight is the approval of the consent agenda. I need a motion. So move. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion. My motion. Karen, second. Yes. Yes. Uh, and we approved it. Uh, any other business? What? Where is that? Any other business? Anything? Anything on the calendar? I know there is. Nothing. Got some district basketball games coming up uh, over the next week. Yeah. Okay. We're hosting some games next week, right? Yeah. Oh, I know. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. It keeps everybody informed. I mean, in the past, I don't, I don't think I would have known on the regular weekend. And I was out of town. I was like, and so it was fun to see all of this stuff happening and being so far away, but yet I feel like I was a part of it too. And, and I was saying, I mean, I was the I think that's it. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming tonight.